church. Welcome to our online service. My name is Brian. I'm the worship leader here at Harvest Fresno. We just want to invite you to join us in the Psalms this morning. Psalm 143. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all you have done. I ponder the works of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. And as our souls thirst for something more that only God can give us, that Christ is indwelling in us, we praise Him. We raise our voices to Him. We lift the name of Jesus high this morning online so that everywhere around the world the name of Jesus might be praised. Join us as we enter into this time of praise. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. With streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, when I found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out on. Turn back to praise when the darkness closes in, Lord. Still, I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Good morning. My name is Ben Dosti, pastor of Harvest Fresno. So glad you could join us to worship the Lord this beautiful morning. And if you are new and just tuning in, we are uh, so grateful that you uh, have uh, joined us to, to worship the Lord. And uh, we would love to know who you are. So uh, please uh, reach out to us. You can uh, fill out a uh, Connect card on our website, and we would encourage you to do that. And uh, we could have further communication with you. Meantime, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this time where we can uh, gather uh, wherever we are to, to worship you. Um, we know that uh, uh, the church is uh, not a building that uh, the redeemed, the community of the redeemed, 
um, is your church. And so, Lord, I, I pray that uh, you would be exalted this morning as we worship you. I know that people are not here um, and not tuning in to um, hear from um, opinions and, and uh, ideas and, and thoughts from, from a person. They want to hear from you, the, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so I pray, Lord, that it would be your words that go forth, that it would penetrate our hearts. Lord, there's uh, many people that are uh, just discouraged right now, and uh, they've been um, uh, locked down, and uh, it's just been a challenge uh, not to uh, interact and, and be with each other. So I just pray that uh, you would uh, be with them, that you would minister to them, that you would use your word to, uh, to encourage uh, those that are, are listening now. And also, Lord, um, our desire is ultimately to be changed, and we don't want to be the same. We want to be uh, conformed into the image of your Son, so we pray that it would be your word that does this mighty work, a work that we can never do on our own. We need you. We need the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives to uh, affect this, this change that we desire. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Well, we are living in a time when we are bombarded with information. Uh, all sorts of media outlets exist now, and the challenge is really determining what is true and what is false. Uh, just a few years ago, I never imagined that there would be these uh, ideas that have uh, surfaced recently, and we have terms now, fake news and alternate facts. Never would have thought we would have those, but they exist. And especially at a time like this, um, with a pandemic, there's just been a huge increase in the amount of misinformation that has uh, surfaced and ha that has been transmitted through social media. I'd like for you to take a look at this uh, clip, which uh, talks about this a little bit. As the COVID-19 epidemic sweeps across the world, it's been accompanied by a tsunami of misinformation. Drink lemon and bicarbonate. Oh my Salt God. Salt water, chlorokine. Hold your breath over 10 seconds to check if your lung is healthy. If you keep sipping hot water, that washes it down to your stomach. At a time when reliable information is vital for public health, fake news about COVID-19 might be spreading even faster than the facts. We're not just fighting an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic. Fake news spreads faster and more easily than this virus and is just as dangerous. The director of the World Health Organization, as you heard, said that we have an infodemic. We have a pandemic of lies and misinformation. And this is not exclusive just to this pandemic and COVID. It is rampant. And it exists because, in a sense, we are now the media. Uh, the, the people have been empowered through these uh, social media platforms to be the media. So we have to be very careful about the information that we transmit that it is truthful. And I'd like you to take a look uh, real quick at another clip that exposes some of the danger that exists uh, from transmitting uh, false information. Fake news. Lots of things probably come to mind when you hear the words fake news. But what you may not realize is that fake news is your fault. And I'm not talking about news that you just don't like. I'm talking about news that isn't real. I've worked in the media industry for more than 10 years. It's fun and it's exciting because it's always changing, but I've also seen the dangers of it. When I was a reporter in Fort Myers, I worked with Haley Hines. Now she's an anchor in Tampa. And one day she was at work and she was being bombarded with notifications on her cell phone. People were saying some pretty hurtful things. She was even getting death threats, and she had no idea why. So she put her investigative journalism skills to work, and she found out that all of that hate online stemmed from one tweet, and it came from a stranger 
across the country. Earlier in the day, a video started going viral, and it was of a blonde woman in a nail salon saying racist things to a woman who worked at the nail salon. And for some reason, this stranger in California tweeted that that blonde woman was Haley. It looked nothing like her, but she tweeted that, and then other people started sharing it. On Facebook, they were even screen grabbing her picture and sharing it. One person on Twitter with a verified account, with the word journalist in his bio, and with more than two million followers retweeted it. Haley was online like crazy, saying, this wasn't me, this wasn't me. She even told Twitter what was happening. And Twitter said it didn't go against their guidelines. Haley was an innocent victim of fake news. And fake news exists because of people like you. Now, I'm not accusing you of doing something like what this woman in California did, but I am accusing you of sharing or commenting or liking something before you really knew it was true or not. That's why you need to use care before you share. As you can see, it's so easy for lies and misinformation to take a life for, for itself and create great harm. As English novelist uh, <coughs> Issa um, Blagden wrote over 150 years ago, if a lie is only printed often enough, it becomes a quasi-truth. And if, if the truth is repeated often enough, it becomes an article of belief, a dogma, and men will die for it. It's so true, and it's never been easier uh, due to the advent of uh, mass communication and the Internet for this to happen. And so it's very important for us as Christians to be extremely careful, uh, care, as, as um, that uh, reporter said, care before we share, that we have to be very careful about the information that we share because it has to be truthful. Christ has a lot to say about truth and what it means for Christians to be truthful. It's the portion of Scripture that we've landed on in the Sermon of the Mount. We are now at Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 to 37. Uh, let's take a look at what Jesus has to say about speaking the truth. Verse 33, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So here we are on the fourth illustration that uh, Jesus gives, as he uh, told us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, that um, our righteousness is to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, which is, again, for the audience, just an unthinkable thing, as they were considered very holy men. But he's saying that it is not enough. It's not good enough. So he gave us various um, illustrations to really expose our false belief about really being satisfied with our righteousness and showing just how, um, how uh, deflated and how ineffective our righteousness is in light of a holy standard. So, here again is the fourth illustration, and um, <laughs> this is uh, something that's very relevant for us. Um, Truth uh, is, in a postmodern world, uh, under attack. There is a, uh, just a complete rejection of an absolute truth. And there is a belief that really uh, tr truth can never really be known. Or it is really just deemed irrelevant if it prevents you from getting what you want. That's the, that's the world that we're living in right now. 
As a Roman um, orator Cicero said, truth is the highest thing a man may experience. Sadly, with most people, it is an infrequent experience. Things really change. We live in a, in a fallen world and, and lies are, are prevalent. But that's not the way that Christians should live. So in light of this, we have Christ's teaching on uh, vows and oaths. And so the first thing that we're going to look at is Christ's teaching on oaths and truth. Christ's teaching on oaths and truth. And the first one is God's teaching about oaths and truth. So now you say, well, isn't Christ God? Yes. But I wanted to first explain the, uh, the teaching that God gave us through the Bible about speaking the truth. Then we're going to talk about the Pharisees and the scribes' perversion of that truth, and then how Jesus kind of ups the ante and gives us the true spirit of the law. So those are the three things that we're going to look at this morning. The first one is, again, God's teaching about oaths. Verse 33, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. So the command is that um, we are not to um, break an oath or take an oath. Um, the issue is that we are to do it faithfully. Uh, in the Old Testament, there's a, a number of things that we can learn about oaths and vows. First of all, they were commanded. They were commanded. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20, uh, Moses recorded, You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and hold fast to him, and by his name you shall swear. So that's just really uh, uh, an emphasis of just really how it was commanded that we, shall, we should do this. And secondly, what it's telling us here is that you've heard it said of old that you shall not swear falsely, is that uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, invoke the name of the Lord if we had no intention of, of uh, fulfilling the vow. So in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12, Moses recorded, you shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. So again, we should, um, have, uh, known, uh, we should not swear if we have no intention of living up to the vow. And thirdly, he, he, he gives a warning. He gives a warning here that, uh, but you shall perform to the Lord all that you've sworn. So if you're making a vow and you swear to do something, he's warning you, be careful if you don't do it. In Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, Moses records, If a man vows a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do accordingly, according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. So, here we see that vows were assumed. They were uh, even encouraged here. But once made, they were not to be broken under any circumstances. That, that's the idea here. And there's many examples in the Old Testament of, uh, of those in the Old Testament making vows. Um, Abraham uh, told his uh, servant, Eliezer, um, to uh, swear by the Lord, uh, the God of heaven and earth, and of um, the God of earth, that you would not take a wife from, uh, for Isaac uh, from among the uh, pagan Canaanites. Uh, instead, take him from the relatives of Abraham's homeland. So you have that, uh, that, that oath, in a sense. Uh, David uh, swore uh, to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob in uh, Psalm 132. And you have Paul uh, swearing uh, to the Lord uh, in, uh, throughout the uh, New Testament. In Romans chapter 1, verse 9, he says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the uh, gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you. So God is my witness. He's calling and he's making a, an oath and, uh, and a vow. He's inviting God to witness the truthfulness of what he's saying. So, an oath was generally taken to be considered an absolute truth. And whoever uh, made that vow is, uh, just had a, a greater emphasis that it was um, going to be uh, followed through. And if they didn't follow through, there was going to be a consequence. Now, now the question is, why did God allow for oaths and vows to take place. Well, he did that and allowed for an appropriate use of vows and oaths 
because it was an accommodation for sinful man to live in a community. It was an accommodation knowing that men are generally deceitful, that in order to live in a community together, there had to be a way for man to say, now, you really got to believe me on this. I, I, I know that you don't believe much of what I say, but in this particular thing, you really got to believe me. That, that was necessary. For life to, to, to happen, for, for people to be trusted, and for uh, things to take place that God wanted to take place. There has to be this, this trust involved, and there, uh, in a land of distrust, there has to be times where you really can trust someone to do something. So that was really the, the purpose. So uh, knowing that man was uh, prone to deceit, it, it's again, it's a result of the fall. It's a result of the fall. In in Psalm chapter 58, verse 3, the psalmist writes, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. And and Scott Peck writes, uh, he says, Children lie naturally. He says the tendency to lie is absolutely natural to a child. If it's not checked, it leads into deeper and deeper evil. Let me give you a quote. The child generally lie and steal and cheat, and want to make reality what they want it to be is routinely observable. The fact that sometimes they grow up to become truly honest adults is what seems more remarkable. That's pretty amazing, but true. You don't have to teach a child to lie. They're not corrupted by their environment. They're corrupted by the sin that exists in their hearts. And the line is an outward expression of that sin. And so that is the result, really, of that's how we are in a community. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 16, he allows for an accommodation to take place, again, for the use of oaths. For people swear by something greater than themselves in all their disputes, an oath is a final confirmation. So, again, in light of being deceitful, generally speaking, he's providing this use of oaths as a final determination of a dispute. So, in other words, you're, you're arguing with someone, and then someone finally invokes the name of the Lord and says, I'm telling you the truth. It was a, an accommodation to end disputes here. So, Vows and oaths were just a way for sinful man to live in community. <clears throat> now, it's really for the benefit of man. But once again, once the Pharisees and the scribes got a hold of this law, they did what they typically do. They twist it and they pervert it for their own purposes, and that's what we find coming up next. So we're going to now look at the Pharisees' teaching about oaths and truth. Verse 33, again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. So again, you've heard it said of old. Again, this is um, saying he's not quoting Scripture. He's quoting the, he's saying there's an interpretation that you're believing about the scriptures of oaths and vows, and he's speaking to that. And <clears throat> that's what he is referring to. And so this, to the traditional teaching, which we had just looked at, was now twisted, and there was a massive uh, abuse that was taking place with respect to oaths and vows. And so uh, rabbis made all sorts of um, rules and regulations surrounding oaths and vows. And the abuses involved two um, great errors. The first was uh, what William Barclay called frivolous swearing. Frivolous swearing. That's <clears throat> taking an oath or vow when it was absolutely unnecessary because the matter was just so trivial. So it's, in other words, it's invoking and swearing on, on a person or a thing over, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to pass you the salt. <laughs> you know, I, I swear I'm going to pass you the, the, the salt. It's just like, it was just over trivial things that didn't need to take place. And the second um, 
uh, abuse that took place was what's called evasive swearing, evasive swearing. So instead of invoking the name of the Lord in your oath or vow, what you do is you invoke something that is considered important. Um, I, uh, I, I swear on the temple, I swear on the altar, I swear on my health or even my life or a family member that what I'm saying is true. So they, they use these other things, and because it was not the name of the Lord, if you broke that, it really didn't matter. So it was like a, a little shell game that was, that was taking place that they were doing here about it, to, uh, picking these, these uh, people and objects to swear upon. And again, it was not binding. That was a whole thing. Uh, the Mishnah, which is part of the Talmud, which is a commentary on the Old Testament, there's a whole section on oaths and vows. And it's, it's very intricate. It's, it talks about, um, uh, you know, if you swear on the, um, on the things that you could swear on and, and it wouldn't be might binding and all sorts of things, as long as you didn't reference the name of, the, of God. People took oaths on the temple again, uh, on, on the different uh, objects that were considered uh, sacred and holy, but that didn't matter as long as it wasn't the name of the Lord. And so, again, this is the, these legalists reducing the law to something in a way that they can obey. It's basically easy believism. It's, it's taking a standard that they cannot live up to and reducing it in a way where they can live it out. So, 20th century German theologian uh, Helmut um, uh, Thylich wrote about this abuse. He said, whenever I utter the formula, I swear by God, I'm really saying, now I'm going to mark off an area of absolute truth and put walls around it, cut it off from the muddy floods of untruthfulness and irresponsibility that ordinarily overruns my speech. In fact, I am saying even more than this. I am saying that people are expecting me to lie from the start. And just because they are counting on my line, I have to bring these big guns of oaths and words of honor in order to drive a breach into these abysmally be pessimistic prejudices of my fellow men. This is a closed phalanx of distrust and justified distrust too. See, you have these, these, these fences and these compartments. Nothing's really changed. We, we have these categories of lives that, that we created that are, that are permissible. Uh, Tim Keller writes uh, quite a bit on this. And the first one is very familiar, right? We have things called white lies. We have white lies. Uh, I, 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 I'd love to uh, come over to your house for the barbecue, but I, I have a previous commitment. I have a commitment with my couch to watch the ball game. I'm not going over, right? Uh, it's a white lie. Uh, you know, the f famous thing about, you know, someone calls, calls the office and, and the boss says, you know, tell that person I'm not here. That, that's considered a white lie. Or an exaggeration, an exaggeration, right? How many times in an argument do you say, you always... Or you never. The truth of the matter is, when we say that, when we say you always, it just means you're doing that more than I want you to. And you never is, you're really not doing what I want you to do enough. That's what those things mean. So we exaggerate. And there's another thing called word inflation. That is incredible. That's a wonderful. That's amazing. And you keep using these, these just uh, incredible and, and amazing words all the time so that it doesn't really mean anything when something is truly amazing or incredible. So there's word inflation. Another thing is something that's just called benevolent lies. Uh, that's when, um, you know, if I told that person the truth, ee, they're not going to like it too much. 
It's, it's going it's to hurt their feelings. And so we, um, we don't tell them the truth. We don't tell them the truth. If, uh, if, a, if a child shows you a painting, you know, you say, that's incredible. That's just the best painting I've ever seen. And, you know, where it's going in the trash can as soon as they show it to you. Right? And then there's one exclusion clause to this. It's not in all manuscripts, but, but it's in the, the best manuscripts. And that is... If your wife asks you if this dress makes her look fat, the answer is always no, no matter what. That's a little bit of a, of a interpretation, but you get the point. And then there's lies of pride. There's lies of pride. Well, these people, you know what? They, they can't handle the truth. I tell them the truth, but they're just not sophisticated enough, and they don't know how to deal with it properly and, and, and manage it, so I'm not going to tell them. The little people can't handle it. So those are sins of pride. And then there's something just general business lies, where you know, businesses uh, lie all the time to, uh, about uh, uh, sales and uh, expense reports and all sorts of things like that. Even saying we are committed to quality, and then you have, uh, as Tom Peter said, uh, you work your workers so hard and demand so much of them that there's no way in the world they could produce the quality that you were promising. And that's just, well, you know, everyone does it. Sales, ever, does it, you lie on us to make a sale? Nah, everyone does that. Who doesn't do that? The problem is, in God's economy, there's no half truths. A half truth is a whole lie. A white lie is just simply a lie. God never reduces his standard for truthfulness. And you know, all of it, at the end of the day, we've been talking a lot about this, is idolatry. It's all idolatry. Why do we lie? Why do we lie? Because if we told the truth, it's going to prevent us from getting what we really want. That's, that, that's why we lie. It's all idolatry. See, I, I, I'm not going to tell my spouse that I, I bought a new dress or, or a new shirt because they're going to blow their stack. And so you don't want that negative reaction. You're valuing your personal peace and comfort more than that, so you don't tell the truth. You, tell the, you don't want to tell the truth if someone, it's going to hurt someone's feelings because you want to be like that by that person. So the, the desire to be approved of and liked is more important than telling the truth and, and honoring Christ. We think that person can't handle the truth, which means what? We're acting like God. And we want to be in control. And so we're valuing our control more than the truth or valuing Christ. It's all idolatry. It's an abuse and a perversion of, of God's law for our benefit, for our selfish desires. That brings us to the third point, Jesus' teaching about oaths and truth. And verse 34, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of a great king. And do not take an oath by uh, your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply uh, be simply yes or no. Anything more than that comes from evil. So in contrast to these abuses that have taken place, by the uh, scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus, in a sense, just reasserts his divine standard. And he's basically telling them, don't make, make an oath at all. When I say you, don't take a, 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 an oath at all. And some denominations, like the Anabaptists and the Moravians and the Quakers, have taken that as an absolute, and they will not make any, any uh, oaths or, or any vows, and they won't even uh, go to court and swear on a stack of Bibles. But it can't be an absolute statement that we should not make any at all because of the teaching that we just went through in, in the Old Testament 
And even Jesus is using a use of, when he kind of says, truly, truly, I say to you, that's in a sense a vow. God himself making vows. And we talked about uh, Paul making vows in, in the New Testament. So we see uh, New Testament. The idea that, and the way that we should interpret this is that God is not preventing us from making oaths under any circumstance. He just want, doesn't want us to make frivolous and ineffective oaths and vows or just continue the abuse. So one commentator writes, uh, what we have here is not the a condemnation of, uh, what we have here is the condemnation of flippant, profane, uncalled for, and often hypocritical um, oaths used in order to make an impression or to spice our daily conversation. That's what he is uh, condemning. And when he's saying, and do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. What he's saying here is that uh, here you are compartment compartmentalizing all of these these little uh, objects and the point is um, it doesn't make the oath less binding uh, because he is the creator of all of heaven and earth he's the one who rules over jerusalem jerusalem is his city and so he is the God and Lord over everything. So whatever object you choose, whatever person you choose, God is over all of that. So don't make these frivolous vows. In Matthew chapter 23, he writes a really a, a commentary on this as he speaks to the, to the uh, uh, Pharisees and the scribes, where he says, Woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by a temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by an oath. You fools! For which is greater, the gold in the temple that has made this gold, um, that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by an oath. You blind men! For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God by him who sits upon it. It's the same argument. He's saying he's God over everything, that you didn't create these things. He is the creator over all things, so you can't compartmentalize these oaths. And then he talks about, don't take an oath on your head, for you can't make one hair white or black. He said, you didn't create your head. You have no power to change anything. You have no power or authority, so why, why make a vow in your own name? Because you're no one. You have no authority. William Barclay writes, Life cannot be divided into compartments, in some of which God is involved, in others uh, he is not involved. There cannot be one kind of language in the church and another kind of language in the shipyard or the factory or the office. There cannot be one kind of conduct in the church and another conduct, type of conduct in the business world. You see, we're all under the presence of God. And then he goes on to say in verse 37, Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. It's a present imperative. He's saying continually just say yes or no. That, that should be enough. You don't need anything. Any, anything else is, is, is just evil or it comes from the evil one. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus makes this very clear. Where he says to the religious leaders, You are of your father the devil, and you will do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there was no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a, li a liar and the father of lies. So that's what he's saying, that if we are basically um, making vows that we're not fulfilling, we're lying. And we're emulating the father of lies. It's evil. And God is holy. And he's calling us to this, to this radical commitment to truth. James affirms the same thing in James chapter 5, verse 12, where he writes, uh, But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or any oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you do not fall under condemnation. So here's this idea of even falling under condemnation. 
if you are not living a trustworthy life, if you are not being an honest person. Again, this is a call to radical truthfulness. Now, this, this is not saying if you make a silly vow or something that's ridiculous, that you have to keep it. We, ha- we have the example, right, with uh, Herod and, and Salome, where Salome danced and, and Herod offered to uh, give uh, her anything up to half of his kingdom. If she did, so she danced. He was pleased. Uh, Salome goes to her mother, and the mother says, ask for the head of John the Baptist. So she goes to Herod and said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Now, it would have been totally appropriate for him to say, ah, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to commit murder. How about a pony? Right? Uh, that, w- that would have been appropriate. You don't have to fulfill a vow if it's going to cause sin or destruction or it's just absolutely ridiculous. But overall, we should be men and women that are truthful. We know in Proverbs 6, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are abomination to Him, and, and, and two of which are a lying tongue, a false witness, and those who breathe out lies. You see, we, we live in a deceptive world. And deceits, deceit is everywhere. And we have to show that we're different. We, we have to show that we are committed to truth. And again, in this world with social media and not knowing what's true and false, is it, it's challenging. Uh, I... <laughs> I, I fell victim to this this week. There's a uh, arguably the best soccer player in the world, Lionel Messi, uh, is up to get moved, transferred from his club. He doesn't want to be at, at Barcelona any longer. So there's a number. There's a club that's number one in contention, Manchester City. There's other clubs that are all, uh, interested in him as well. But he had a relationship with a coach, and the coach flew out to Spain to to talk and to to deal with this. And then I wake up one morning, and I look at my Twitter feed, and I see that the transfer happened. And I look at the the account, and the account was the name of the soccer club, Manchester City. It wasn't uh, Messi's fan club, you know, account or anything like that. So I sent it to my son, who uh, knows more soccer news than anyone else I know. He said, no, it hasn't happened yet, Dad. And I said, what? And there was a picture of him with a jersey, and it, and it looked so real. And again, the name of the account was the name of the club, and I looked at it, and sure enough, it only had a thousand likes of a, of a, of the account the members following it. So it wasn't the legitimate site. It's so easy to know with Photoshop and, and all these things. It's so easy to uh, fall victim to false information. So we ha- have to be very careful now. Obviously. This didn't elevate to the area of news or something that I'm usually very circumspect about what I what I communicate. Um, if I share an article, I look at a source and things like that. But right now, Christians are very, very uh, susceptible to send out false information and misinformation. And we have to be very careful. It's the equivalent of communicating a lie. We are, we, are, we are sharing information that is factually untrue and we're being negligent in our, in, our, uh, in our research and determining whether something is true or false and we send it out, we're lying. Not to one person potentially, but hundreds of people and potentially thousands of people at a time. This is rampant, even among Christians. <laughs> there was the, a pandemic video Blatantly false information that was shared. And I saw people who, who shared it, and I haven't seen anyone repent that they shared blatantly false information that is potentially harmful to someone. That should not be the case. It's just, it's just a form of lying. And there are those that are really prone to this 
misinformation and conspiracy theories and, and all sorts of things. There was an article by uh, Joe Forrest about why your Christian friends and family are so easily fooled by conspiracy theories. And he comes up with some points that conspiracy theories make us feel special. They make us feel special. Uh, he said that they're really no different than the mystery cults that Paul contended with in, in Ephesus uh, that were common, and they attracted people because they revealed the mysteries of the universe to anyone who really looks into these things. So they're seductive. They, they, um, they spread uh, with, um, with people who, who want to uh, be special, think they have this special knowledge. It's almost like Gnosticism, like you have this special knowledge which makes you really, really special, and no one else is believing it, but you are different, and you know this truth. Um, in, in the death of expertise, Tom Nichols writes, conspiracy theories appeal to uh, also a strong streak of narcissism. There are people who would choose to believe a complicated, nonsense, a complicated nonsense rather than accept their own circumstances that are incomprehensible. The result of the issues beyond their intellectual capacity to understand or even their own fault. So that's why people dig in. They dig in. And there's another reason, he says, is that because it helps us make sense of a, of a complicated world. So when you believe a conspiracy theory, there's just things that are just hard to understand and why they happen and uh, how things happen. And, and you have these conspiracy theories, and, and they try to come up with an, an answer for these, for these challenging things or these like inexplicable events or these what are called black swan events where these things happen once in a, in a, in a while, like the um, attack on uh, the World Trade Center or uh, this pandemic. So they tried to take the complicated and make it uh, understandable. Again, here's um, Tom Nichols saying, conspiracy theories are a way for people to give context and meaning to events that frighten them. Without a coherent explanation for these terrible things happen to innocent people, they would have to accept such occurrences as nothing more than the random cruelty of an uncaring universe or an incomprehensible deity. So, people say, well, you have to be informed and stay informed. Don't give in to fear. But actually, they're the ones that are very fearful. And conspiracy theories just make a, a reality just m more exciting to, to think about all these plots and, that are taking place and that you know. Again, you have this, this knowledge that, that people don't know. You know this truth. And so we have to be careful, very careful. And uh, in another article about conspiracy theories... Uh, Matt Michelotos writes, uh, the consequence of Christians pushing conspiracy theories is enormous. You see, when we promote conspiracy theories, we're undermining our ability to share the gospel. We're putting out this, this crazy, unrealistic, fantasy material to people, to the world, to the public, and then we're asking them to believe, and God came in the form of a man 2,000 years ago and died on the cross and rose again on the third day. Do you see what that does to the credibility of the gospel? If you just put out all of this crazy material and then all of a sudden you want to tell someone the gospel, it just completely undermines your, your credibility. We can't do that. We have to be very careful. And we have to be careful that when we share this, in a sense, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're forfeiting our, our, our right to be believed when something that really matters. And, and we're feeding into our own biases. And when you do this, when most of these conspiracy theories and things like that are portraying someone else as very evil or a group of people being very evil, and if you believe uh, in a certain political party you are evil or if you're part of a certain race or ethnicity or culture of belief, you are evil. And again, with these conspiracy theories and these, this bad information that's being promoted, it just, again, creates enemies instead of looking at people as lost in the mission field that need to be loved and the truth of the gospel be shared with them. We have to be careful. You can look and see 
before you share, take time. If something is printed on social media, do not believe it. Google search it. Is it true? Uh, do, if it's images, there, there was images of, of crows circling a city in, in, in uh, China that they said was Wuhan because there were so many dead bodies due to the coronavirus, and it was a city taken at a completely different time in a thousand miles away from Wuhan that had nothing to do with the coronavirus, and it was just shared, and oh, look, what, look what they're keeping from us. You could do a reverse search on, on Google for the image and just put in the image, and it will tell you where, where it showed up before. There's sites like factcheck.org and uh, PolitiFact, and you can look up all of these things before you send them out. And be aware of your own bias. Be aware of your own bias. There's a site called allsides.com, which shows news outlets the, from the, from the uh, left and center and right, and find out where you're getting that news and look at the bias of that news. A bias means that the information is being, being tainted and, and uh, presented in such a way to meet that particular uh, belief. So we have to be aware of all of these things and be careful to communicate what is truthful and honorable. And so... We have to realize that there's a cost for telling the truth. There is a cost. In a sense, this idea of a vow is actually a payment. And you may not be liked. You might not be valued at that particular point in time. And that's why we're exhorted to share the truth in love, to speak the truth in love. When we communicate truth, it has to be communicated in love. That's what Jesus did. And that's what Jesus expects us to do. The issue is, with this call to radical truthfulness, we're always going to fall short. We're never going to be able to meet that standard. The, we're always living with three realities. Who we truly are, who we think we are, and what people think we are. To live this way that Christ has called us to live is uh, beyond our capability. Not that we shouldn't try. We should take our thoughts captive under Christ and because out of the heart the mouth speaks, and so it's all heart issues. Again, it's that idolatry that we talked about. But what really matters is that you communicate your dishonesty to the Lord. That, that's how you can live up to the standard. The point of this whole illustration is we can't live up to the standard. And the way that you live up to the standard is by confessing that you can't live up to the standard. You see, Jesus ultimately paid the price for truth. He paid the price for your dishonesty, for my dishonesty. When he was confronted in, in John chapter 18, and he was, he was slapped by the, by the religious leaders, I said, why do you slap me? For, for telling the truth? He goes before Pilate. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm here because of, of the truth. And he said, what is truth? He was killed for the truth. He was hung up on the cross for lies. Your lie. My lie. And so, what we need to do is understand that Jesus on the cross knew everything about you. Knew every dishonest word you've ever uttered, post you ever shared, thought that you harbored in your heart, and he died for you anyways, because he loves you. And our security is in him. He loves us. He accepts us. So that, what does that do? That frees us to be truthful. When you apply the gospel of that truth in your life, you are secure in Christ. You are loved by Christ. So if you say something that someone may not like, that's okay because you are loved by the Redeemer and the Creator of all of heaven and earth. 
The gospel sets you free. The gospel is the only way, applying the gospel is the only way that you are ever going to be able to commit to this radical standard of truth that he gives us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. We are so grateful for the sacrifice of your son. We are so grateful that he lived a perfect life that we could never live. He was perfectly honest and truthful when we were not and cannot be. And we are so grateful for the sacrifice he made so that we can be accepted by our Heavenly Father and have eternal life with you. I pray, Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, that today would be the day of their salvation. Today would be the day that they uh, confess and, and submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and truly believe that he died on the cross for their sins and he is Lord. I also you know, pray for those that know you who might be uh, just struggling in this area. It might be to have a challenging work environment where uh, dishonesty is just accepted and, uh, I just, and they want to say something, but they're afraid. I just pray that you give them the courage and the boldness to be able to be truthful and to speak the truth in love to those that need to hear it. Lord, again, we just thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness.
joining us this morning, and if you know of anyone who might benefit from this message, we would encourage you to share it. And uh, again, also uh, for those uh, just tuning in, uh, we would love to uh, just meet you, and so please submit the Connect card, and we'd also love to pray for you, and uh, that goes for anyone out there. We would love to be able to pray for you, so uh, please uh, fill out that uh, prayer request, and uh, the entire church will be praying for you. In the meantime, know that you are loved.